Unit 1.4 is the principles of programming and there's quite a lot to cover in this unit that's actually really, really interesting. First of all, it's talking about the nature and relative advantages of different programming paradigms and identifying possible situations where they may be used. So what is a paradigm? Well, a paradigm is a specific style of programming and different paradigms give different advantages and disadvantages, so they're often used for very specific purposes. Some of these paradigms are older than others, some of them are very unique to a specific situation, but they all have their own uses. So what are these paradigms? Well, there's a few. We're gonna start with procedural languages, and these are the languages that you're used to dealing with. They have step-by-step -step instructions that are followed. Now, procedural languages give the program the ability to precisely define each step and gives tight control over the underlying operations of the hardware. And so they're really using complicated programs where the exact execution matters. Non-procedural languages then allow the programmer to specify the result they want without having to explain how to do it. So the system decides how to go about doing it. And it's really good with things like database interrogation, where retrieving the answers is probably more important than the exact steps we need AI and modeling applications often written in this way as well. Scripting languages are a little bit more difficult to explain. They are procedural and they're usually interpreted languages, but what they allow is for embedding of code in other objects. And the best example I can give you of this is the use of JavaScript in HTML. JavaScript is the scripting language that runs on the web. So an HTML page by itself isn't interactive. It's the JavaScript that runs inside of that that allows interactivity on top of an existing system. Then we've got object-oriented languages, and that's something that we'll uh, look at in a little bit more detail a bit later. Uh, but basically, on a high-level overview, object orientation uses objects and classes, uh, and they both include the data and the methods that they need, but they separate them in a process called encapsulation. And essentially what it is, it's a sort of a templating idea where we create instances of a template, which are objects, and that means we can inherit from the original templates from other templates and get a lot of functionality from that. This is also called an event-driven language usually because what we're probably gonna have is we're gonna have a user interface for this. So when we click things, things happen, they create events and objects then used aside from that. Then we've got special purpose language and these are mainly designed with feature sets to suit a specific specialist purpose. Machine learning or expert systems are good examples of this where the feature set that we need to build a program is very specific and the features probably wouldn't be that useful in other methods. Fourth generational languages then, and just the name for the current standard of high level languages. We've abstracted so far from machine code and that happens time after time, becoming more and more like a natural language. And as that happens, we get further away from the machine code, the ones and zeros that runs on the CPU. We're currently working on about the fourth generation above that. This means that a high level programming language has a syntax that is a mix of English and technical grammar. Natural language paradigms then are designed to be able to infer meaning from, well, just that, natural language. A full sentence in English, an everyday command, should be interpreted to be a series of instructions that the computer can execute. Visual programming languages then, and think Scratch for this, are usually block-based. Uh, they usually are a high-level language, but instead of having to remember all the commands and all the syntax, it's dragging blocks together that click together and build the basic building blocks. Uh, this is really good for beginners because they don't have to memorize everything and they don't get stuck with basic syntax issues. Finally, we have application packages with programming capabilities, and this is where a general purpose app has some programming element on top of it to extend or customize the basic code base. Now, a good example of this is Microsoft Excel, where it's basically a spreadsheet program, but we can add on top of that some VBA to allow it to do some more advanced tasks. The next objective is describing the role of OOP, the object oriented approach to programming and the relationship between objects, classes, and methods. So this is really, really straightforward, really. object oriented programming uses classes, and I want you to think of a class as a template, the design for how something should work and look. When we create an instance of that class then to actually use, what we're doing is making an object, and that object is a working instance of it, an actual thing in the program that can be used and manipulated. Methods are actions that can be performed on that object, and properties is the data stored by the object. And OLP uses this thing called encapsulation, which is where we separate the properties and the method. And this is quite useful because it means that other objects 
can't just change the properties of another object. They have to go through the methods, and that means there's code associated with changing the properties. So, for instance, if you had an object-orientated design for a system that checks how much fuel is in a plane, if you were to increase the cargo, there would be some code to automatically increase the amount of fuel expected to have in it. Without encapsulation, it is possible for a process to increase the amount of cargo without changing the amount of fuel. Here is an example of an OOP diagram. The properties are the second box down and the methods are the bottom box. You'll see the properties of the data, so the character has a name and a model stored within it. Those are inaccessible from outside the object, but these methods are accessible. Set name, so change it, get name, return the name back to whoever called for it, and set the model. So a character can have multiple bits of data, or the properties, and multiple methods. Inheritance, then, is where properties and methods can be used from previous classes. And in this example here, we've got two classes that inherit from it. So what they get is they get the properties and methods from the class they inherited from, and we extend or override it. So for instance, the player class here has controls and health itself, but also inherits name and model. In the same way in the methods, we've said it has set health, get health, and move, but it's also inherited set name, get name, and set model. And this is a nice way of being able to find classes that are basically the same as the previous one, but with a few changes. Next objective then, describe the need for standardization of computer languages and the potential difficulties involved in agreeing and implementing those standards. There are a bunch of reasons that we need to have standards. And these are all the advantages you get, really. Portability of programs. If you have a standard way of doing something, that program can be ported to different hardware products. Programmers are also more portable. If it's a standard way of working and you're trained up in working in it, you can move between different projects and work on the same sort of thing. Standardization also makes it easier to maintain the software because more people understand. And of course, there's a formal specification for how it should be written and how it should interact. Acceptability is important. That is the software acceptable for us to use? Is that an acceptable use for us? If we've got a standard software model or standard hardware model, there's no more chance of it being accepted as a working part of the product. Of course, the development will become faster then because the more we know about it, the quicker we can develop things, the more people we can throw at the task, and the easier it is to build things. And if we build upon existing standards and we expand it a little bit, then we've got a starting point. We can also deliver a standard library of ways in working with it, and of course, standard algorithms. Standardization like working with algorithms like quicksort and things like that, if we use standard algorithms, we know the big O complexity of them, and we know the expected return times and things like that. It just makes it easier to program code. However, for standards to work, all manufacturers and developers must follow them, and this isn't always the case. Sometimes developers will have a better idea of how to do something and want to do it different. And the worst case examples of this are things like Internet Explorer doing its own thing with web standards in the late 90s. And because Internet Explorer was the dominant browser platform, people programmed for Internet Explorer and the standards compliant browsers didn't work very well. Complicated ideas and interconnected systems can be difficult to turn into a set of standards as well. So like USB and the Thunderbolt standards, uh, they have the same cable, but they have different specifications. And that will change in an upcoming version of USB, uh, but not at the moment. So you can buy a cable that looks identical, and it can be the wrong standard, and it won't give you all the features that you expect. The next objective is about identifying ambiguities in natural language and explain the need for computers to have an unambiguous syntax. So first of all, what are we talking about? Well, natural language has loads of ambiguities. If somebody says, set an alarm for five, well, what do they mean? Is it 5 a.m., 5 p.m., five minutes in the future? I mean, I can only dream of the day when Siri will get this right and doesn't start setting alarms for 4.30 in the morning when I mean 4.30 in the afternoon. And in mathematics, we've conquered that by using a thing called bid mass, which is a way of removing the ambiguity from the expression. So if you've got four times three plus nine divided by three, uh, then you apply bid mass to it, brackets, indices, division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction, and we know which order to do those operations on. So it's unambiguous what that mathematical statement means. Programming languages, then, must be unambiguous. They can't have any ambiguous syntax, as because the computer would not be able to execute the instructions if it wasn't clear exactly what was intended, which is why we need that unambiguous syntax. How do we get that unambiguous syntax? Well, 
we're going to use things like Bacchus Naur form and syntax diagrams. Let's take a look at those. Syntax diagrams look a little bit like this, and you basically read them from left to right so that it unambiguously defines the syntax of a programming language. In this example here, we're defining a variable that will have a single letter, A to F, and then one or more numbers, and finally a dollar symbol. So you read it from left to right, you'll see there's a box there that says a letter, and there's what that box means is there's another definition of it somewhere else. Then we have a number, and you notice the arrow there either goes on to the dollar symbol or back to the number, so I have to have one or more numbers. Then I have the dollar symbol, and then I'm done. Now this syntax diagram assumes you've already defined letter, as it is on the left here, and number, as it is on the right. So syntax diagrams are reasonably straightforward ways of designing things and really make recursion or iteration upon any of the elements quite simple to define. BNF or Bacchus Naur form is a way of explaining that same thing without using a diagram. You'll see the style we use. We use uh, the chevron pointy brackets to define the names of things. We use two colons and an equal sign and then on the right hand side we define what we're doing. The vertical lines mean or and if items are put together, it means an AND. So for instance, letter is A or B or C or D or E or F. A digit is any of the single numbers. And then I'm saying that a number is a digit or a digit and a number. And that means that a number can be zero or it can be zero, five, six, seven, nine, two, one, two, two, three, four, five, six. It's recursive, it keeps looping back on itself. That's hard to get your brain around, uh, but that's how we do that looping back structure. Uh, finally, a variable then is a letter and a number and a dollar. 